Greetings, everyone. I'm Stephanie Eccles. My pronouns are she, her, and I have light brown hair just beyond my shoulders. And today I'm proud to be wearing my brand new dark purple Axcon shirt. Just a little bit about me. I have about 15 years experience as a front-end focused developer. And my career journey has spanned marketing, product, and design systems. I enjoy sharing my knowledge as a writer, speaker, instructor, and podcast host. And I'm also a mom who enjoys baking. Today, we'll be learning modern CSS capabilities for building accessibly inclusive layouts. We have several topics to cover, including focus visibility, focus versus source order, desktop zoom and reflow, and respecting user preferences. So let's get started with focus visibility. There are two criterion to consider for focus visibility. 2.4.7 is focus visible, which means keyboard operable interfaces must have visible focus indicators. The second criterion is 2.4.11, which is focus appearance and minimum criteria. Now, this is still in draft for WCAG 2.2, but it is going to give us criteria for developing clearly distinguishable focus indicators. And in order to best assess how to develop a focus style, let's go ahead and examine these guidelines that are being proposed for focus appearance. The main point to remember from these guidelines is that any outline that is at least two pixels thick and contrasts with the non-focus state would pass this criterion. So to illustrate that, here is a dark purple button in its default state where it has that dark purple background and white text. Then next to it is a button, the same button in its focus state. And we've added a white two pixel dashed outline that is inset inside of the button. This outline is going to pass for both contrast and width requirements. Now this focus appearance criterion is broken into three separate considerations for scenarios that are more ambiguous than a simple two pixel properly contrasted outline. The first consideration is minimum area, which means that the focus style either has an outline that comprises the area of a one CSS pixel thick perimeter of the unfocused button, or has a shape with the area of a four CSS pixel thick line along the shortest side of a minimum bounding box of the unfocused component and no thinner than two CSS pixels. Now, I don't blame you if you found those considerations confusing. So the too long didn't read summary for minimum area is that authors are encouraged to make the change as significant as possible. For example, by designing a thick border around the component. So again, here are our demo buttons. We've replaced the previous dashed outline with the solid outline, and this is still inset in the button. The second consideration is contrasting area, meaning an area of the focus indicator contrasts at least three to one between the colors in the focused and unfocused states. Our demo button is again using the dashed inset outline, but one example shows it in white which actually exceeds the three to one contrast. And the second shows it in magenta, which fails the contrast requirement. The third consideration is adjacent contrast, which means that the contrasting area also has a contrast ratio of at least three to one against adjacent colors in the focused component, or the contrasting area has a thickness of at least two CSS pixels. Now, contrasting area means the area around the focused element. So our button styles of either dashed or solid outlines are inset, which ensures this criterion is met. If they were not inset, we'd have to be mindful of the background behind the button and ensure that the focus met the contrast against both the button and that surrounding background. 
Okay, so let's see how we can set up our styles for focus visibility success using modern CSS. The first step, as shown here, is to prepare CSS custom properties that correspond to outline property values. For our selector, we're being ultra modern and using is, which lets us list all of the standard focusable elements, including A, button, input, text area, and summary. A unique property we've included is the outline size property, which we've set using the max CSS function. This will allow the outline to scale with the element due to the 0.08M value, but also prevent it from being smaller than two pixels. In other words, if 0.08M goes to smaller than two pixels, that means it's not the max value. So two pixels will be selected and used instead. We've also defaulted the outline color to the current color keyword under the assumption that the text color is already passing contrast. So therefore, a matching outline color would as well. Step two is assigning these properties when those focusable elements actually receive focus. So in addition to defining the standard outline property, we've also set up the outline offset property. This is what was allowing the outline on our demo buttons to be inside of the button. As a default, this is going to match the outline size value. But custom property syntax also allows us to include an undefined variable, which we've used to allow for an optional outline offset property. So now we can explicitly override just the offset as needed, such as for our button styles, while setting a sensible default. Here we have an example of how we would customize for that button instance. Shown is the default behavior as applied to a text link. Then a code snippet for the button elements where the outline offset has a negative value. And that's what's pulling it inside of the element. The snippet also shows customizing the outline style property to dashed. Using custom properties to prepare outline styles allows for both consistency and flexibility while setting defaults that are likely to pass focus visibility conditions for most elements. Now, there is another property you may have heard of called focus visible. And based on heuristics, browsers by default, newly in, in all of our most recent uh, evergreen browsers, may only show focus indicators for the state of focus visible. Now, this means that possibly only keyboard users will see focus upon tabbing to our interactive elements if you have not defined a separate focus style in your styles. All right, so now that we're set up with accessible focus styles, let's move on to learning about focus versus source order. The related WCAG criterion here is 2.4.3 focus order, which states that for both visual and non-visual users, the focus order, which is typically initiated by keyboard tapping, should proceed logically. Now, usually, this means matching source order to prevent visually jumping around randomly. As one example of this, here is a grid of text links arranged in a 3 by 3 grid. If you are cited, what do you expect the focus order to be? perhaps left to right across the first row, then to the second row, and so on. Or maybe even going top to bottom by a column would be acceptable. With the numbers revealed, we see that the visual order has been customized by explicitly placing links in particular grid cells. So the first visual link is actually in position 7, the second in position 5, and the rest of the order is jumbled as well. So this is an example of using the capabilities of CSS Grid at the cost of producing an illogical order for visual focus. For this section, we don't have any snippets to review, but rather a caution against using certain modern CSS techniques that have the potential to negatively affect focus order. And it all comes down to carefully considering situations 
where you are altering placement with things like absolute fixed or sticky positioning, grid areas, the order property for both grid and flexbox, and possibly using masonry layout. If you were able to catch Rachel Andrew and her presentation, she went into how this is done. And the thing about these contexts is that if you're including focusable elements, you may want to just choose an alternate situation. So how do we actually fix it? Again, being mindful of how you develop your source. In addition, if you find that you have an error in your focus versus visual order, very strongly consider reordering the source instead of using CSS. Let's change our focus and dive into desktop zoom and reflow. The WCAG criteria here is 1.4.10 for reflow. Reflow is the term for supporting desktop zoom up to 400% where content should reflow into a single column without loss of content or functionality and without requiring scrolling in two dimensions. So what is the impact at this high zoom level? First, it's important to understand that on a 1280 pixel wide resolution at 400% zoom, the viewport content is equivalent to 320 pixels wide. Let's compare that 320 pixels by 256 pixel viewport in relation to how much that space is against the resolution of an iPhone SE, which has a portrait resolution of 375 pixels by 667 pixels. In portrait mode, the equivalent of viewing area from our zoom is equivalent to about the top half of the iPhone screen. If we switch to landscape mode, it's very equivalent to viewing the left half. And we can observe that the height in landscape mode is roughly equivalent to the zoomed viewport height, given that the viewable phone area would include things like browser, Chrome, and toolbars. Now, we've just compared the viewable area to a phone, which may have caused you to wonder if we can solve for zoom by using responsive design. So before we move on, let's reframe some expectations of developing for Reflow versus how you might be familiar with developing a responsive design. In considering Reflow, our user is on a desktop, not a mobile device. And to meet the Reflow criterion, we want to rearrange, not remove, content and functionality. The viewable area orientation is closer to landscape than portrait, and critically, if we are to handle reflow successfully, we must remember that viewport size is not a proxy for device or user capabilities. A concept intrinsically linked to responsive design is changing layouts with media queries. In terms of the reflow, there is no dedicated Zoom media query, but we must be aware that media queries that affect viewports less than 320 pixels will affect the results of reflow. So what are some layout breaking scenarios that have the potential to affect reflow? Sticky navigation that covers half or more of the viewport once it is zoomed up to that high level. Contained scroll areas that will become unscrollable or cut off. Unwanted results when using fluid typography techniques. Overflow or overlap issues that again cut off content. And finally, spacing that appears too large relative to the content size, which affects readability and overall user experience. So one area that I think helps drive home the impact of Zoom in an interface is section spacing. Here is a CSS rule applying a margin top of 128 pixels between each section element. Now on a desktop with no zooming applied, which is considered the default 100% zoom level, the spacing feels appropriate for spacing out these sections. However, when the screen is zoomed to 400%, 
that same 128 pixels becomes equivalent to nearly half the height of the viewport. Now, the space no longer feels appropriate for the context. The impact here is extra scrolling or even giving the perception there is no more content if the next item ends up completely out of view. So let's review the impact of strict values like pixels and rims compared to viewport units like view height. First, let's examine how the element with a height of 128 pixels appears across the zoom levels. First of 100% zoom, then 200% zoom, 300, and finally 400%. Just like we observed with the margin, now that it is applied to height, we see that height increasing. And by the 400% zoom level, again, covering nearly half of the available viewport height. We're using height in this demonstration to be able to visualize the impact on space. Now let's review the impact of that same element's height when switching from pixels to view height at, that, at those zoom levels. The relative height across zoom sizes appears equivalent although you may have noticed that the text size still increases as expected. If we examine the 300 and 400% zoom levels for the element using view height as a measurement, we have a few extra labels here to help with the measurements in perspective. At 300% zoom, the viewport size registers as 426 pixels by 347 pixels, and that 25 view height is equivalent to 87 pixels. Then bumping up to 400% zoom, the view height is the expected reflow size of 320 pixels by 260 pixels. And now that same 25 view height registers as 65 pixels. So we've had slightly over a 20 pixel reduction in computed size of our element. So now that we better understand the impact of using pixels versus viewport relative units in the context of Zoom, let's update our previous section rule, which as a reminder, set a margin top of 128 pixels. And shown here is just, again, a reminder of what that impact was, where it's covering uh, almost half of that viewport height. Now, instead, our modern CSS solution swap will be to use the min function. This function takes in a list of possible values, and depending on the context, it will use the smaller computed value. So we'll actually still pass in that 128 pixels, but also 15 view heights. And when we review the rest of the zoom levels from 200 to 400%, the impact is that as soon as 128 pixels is larger than the computed value of 15 view height. Since we've used the min function, the browser is choosing 15 view height to use as the margin. Zoom level, the computed margin size is labeled. And as quickly as hitting 200% zoom, the margin begins to use the view, view height because 78 pixels is, of course, 28 pixels. By the 400% zoom level, what was previously a space taking up half the viewport height when we were only using pixels is now only 15%. Now, the practical impact of this technique is that you can appease your designers by using their expected pixel value for the quote unquote ideal desktop view while allowing a contextual affordance once that context changes. Now, what I love about this technique is that it helps in our true mobile context as well, where the 15 view height is again likely to be selected. Heads up, at the end, I'll provide a link that includes a dynamic demo that you can experiment with and help further understand this layout technique. A second modern CSS spacing technique that positively impacts elements during reflow is to update padding from using a strict value like rim to using a dynamic value computed with the CSS function clamp. Now padding is a unique property when a percentage is used as it's calculated against the elements computed width. In this case, our upgrade to clamp means that the padding value, which 
will never be smaller than one rim and is based on the ideal value of 5%. So that allows our patty to grow up to 1.5 rim. Now, the result for something like this card element, which is shown at 400% zoom, is that the reduced padding allows for a longer line length, which is easier to read than if the padding was set using the stricter, larger value, which, had, which would have resulted in a narrower column of text. Once again, this technique has a positive impact on user experience on mobile as well. The last topic we'll examine is around respecting user preferences. There are two primary types of preferences that we can query for in CSS, motion and color and contrast. And there are two WCAG criteria related to motion. 2.3.1, which is the three flashes or below threshold, which states that we should avoid anything that flashes more than three times in any one second period. And the second criterion is 2.3.3, animation from interactions, which says motion animations triggered by interaction can be disabled unless the animation is essential to the functionality or information being conveyed. The one we'll be considering uh, more of these two criterion is 2.3.3, animation from interactions. The prefers reduced motion feature query allows us to detect operating system settings for motion preferences. And we can attach to this feature query and, and as well as all of the feature queries we'll discuss via either CSS or JavaScript. Important to note is that a lack of this setting does not mean the user is necessarily okay with motion. They may simply not be aware that such a setting exists. So definitely keep the criterion in mind when you are still developing those animations. The modern CSS way to address uh, this prefers reduced motion is from Andy Bell's modern CSS reset. And within this feature query, we select all elements, including all before and after pseudo elements. Then the behavior is that it will run all animations once and complete transitions instantly. The reason for keeping a small duration for animations and transitions is that for JavaScript events, we have animation end and transition end. And in the application, those may be key for triggering additional events. We can test results of this media uh, feature query in a browser. Shown here is the option within Chromium browsers that's found under more tools and rendering. And it is important to test the results, especially to resolve for animations and transitions that may stop in an unideal state or that adversely react to that short duration. In some cases, the rule that we have applied can result in a worse animation event like rapid spinning. Now let's consider the color and contrast criterion. The main WCAG criterion here is 1.4.3, contrast minimum, possibly the most well-known WCAG criterion and also the most missed. Uh, but the criterion states that we should provide enough contrast between text and its background so that it can be read by people with moderately low vision. Now, interestingly, despite a lot of hype over things like dark mode, as well as the availability of operating system settings related to contrast modes, there actually aren't any current criteria indicating a requirement for dark mode or for varying contrast modes. However, to respect dark and light modes and contrast modes is to practice inclusive design. So let's review the three feature queries related to color and contrast. Prefers color scheme, prefers contrast, and forced colors. All of these media queries adapt to an operating system preference. The prefers color scheme feature query lets you explicitly define properties for light or dark color schemes. Now, 
because these variations are at the discretion of the website owner, there's actually no requirement that dark equates to black and light equates to white. A related modern CSS feature is color scheme. This can be defined as both a property and within a meta tag. This feature allows site authors to indicate a page supports light, dark, or both modes. And if it's set on the root or via the meta tag, Chrome in particular will auto apply adjustments using system colors. And the order these are listed indicates preference. So in both the property and meta tag examples here, we've preferenced dark over light. Now, alternatively, we can use this color scheme property just for form controls only, which is where it has a pretty significant impact. The example shows using it to define that the form controls of input, select, and text area can respond to the color modes with light listed first as the preference. The only other custom style in use in our example is using prefers color scheme uh, for dark to change the background to a dark color and the text to light. However, the form controls in a dark mode have adapted to have darkened backgrounds. And this is color scheme in action. Without it, the, con the controls would retain a white background despite being in a dark mode. Next up is prefers contrast, which has a bit of a contested place in the lineup. As noted, this is technically experimental and the spec is in progress. However, we're discussing modern CSS, so I felt it was appropriate to put on your radar. There are four accepted values, no preference, less, more, and custom, where no preference means it's not been set in the operating system, and custom is a user-defined contrast preference. And this is implied if the forced colors query would match, which we'll be talking about a little later on. Now, what's tricky is determining how to handle for the values of less and more. Again, please note that the comments on this slide are not official guidance. More data is needed to establish these criteria as it relates to both accessibility and user needs. With that disclaimer said, what I have gathered from the spec and other resources, which I'll provide later, is that less is intended to help users with light sensitivity, otherwise known as photophobia, and may potentially reduce migraine triggers. Some ways to develop for a less mode is to decrease text versus background contrast, soften color contrast shifts between large areas, and reduce the overall brightness of your color palette in use. In comparison, the intention of more is to help users read text and see details, distinguish UI, and counter low vision impairments, for example, glaucoma. Developing for this mode might mean increasing text versus background contrast, increasing use and width of borders um, to affect better distinguishing UI elements, and removing box shadows and other soft details that don't really help um, to distinguish those UI elements. Our final feature query is forced colors, which corresponds to an operating system preference that increases text legibility through color contrast via built-in or user-defined palettes. This mode is currently best supported in Windows using a Chromium browser. Now, active means that the user's selected theme will overwrite your palette with system colors. The other option is none. The intent of this media query is quite limited. Some examples of reasons you might need to use this media query are to resolve colors for SVG icons, retain custom colors for critical features such as product color swatches where you need your true color, or to resolve issues from lost color. For example, replacing box shadows with borders when box shadows are lost in this mode. Those adjustments may be needed due to the result of removed or changed properties in forced color mode. 
again, including box shadow and text shadow computing to none. The background image computes to none unless the original value contains a URL. So in other words, unless the background image um, leads out to the uh, actual URL. And color scheme that we talked about computes to light as the preference over dark. And the scroll bar color and accent color properties compute to auto. Now, here are listed the four suggested color properties, which I'm not going to list all of them. But suffice it to say that all impactful color-related properties are changed in forest color mode. So, for instance, color, fill, border color, outline color, and background color would be changed. And in place of your original website colors, this reduced palette called system colors are swapped in. These system colors essentially color cover various states, such as distinguishing a visited link or a button or selected text. But the color values are determined by the OS or a contrast theme or user overrides of a contrast theme. We've just discussed three color and contrast related feature queries. So let's summarize considerations for authoring styles for each type. Using prefers color scheme, the expectation is to provide darker and lighter versions that still fully use your brand colors and high fidelity visuals. On the other hand, prefers contrast is intended to provide more and less contrast versions that may require modified palettes and assets. In forced color mode, the intent is to only use it for correcting for loss or change of color in critical elements. Prefers contrast and forced colors might feel like they're addressing similar things. The difference is that prefers contrast, users still want to see your design in colors, just adjusted for their color contrast, or not even color, but their contrast preference. Whereas forced color, the user requires using their own palette for improved usability. My last tip about authoring for feature queries is that you are able to chain them where needed. For example, you might query for the combination of prefers color scheme dark and prefers contrast more, or prefers color scheme light and prefers contrast less. Today, we learned about several WCAG criteria where CSS features can make or break the experience, as well as contribute to inclusive design. For improved focus visibility, we set up consistent, customizable focus styles using custom properties. In considering focus versus source order, we learned about order breaking properties and were encouraged to change the order in the source, not with CSS. To improve the experience related to desktop zoom and reflow, we traded pixels for view heights and percent and learned about using CSS functions like min, max, and clamp for dynamic contextual spacing. Finally, we learned about respecting user preferences as we considered feature queries and their benefits for inclusive design. We covered a lot of information and techniques, so be sure to pick up a copy of the slides from the sessions page and check out the coded demos for each topic we covered. Those are available at moderncss.dev slash axcon22 with no hyphen in axcon. The demos include a brief summary and are followed with additional resources for learning more. Thanks so much for attending and I hope you enjoy the rest of axcon and I'm ready for questions. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Fantastic presentation. We've got a, a nice active uh, chat group here, putting a lot of questions in. Uh, we've got a lot of specific questions. So uh, for those of you that are looking to submit questions, please, please do so. Also uh, use that upvote, that thumbs up uh, feature uh, to make sure that uh, the best questions uh, make it toward the, the, the top of the list here. So 
so we can get the most popular ones addressed. All right, Stephanie, top question. Um, if 400% if zoom shouldn't require two-dimensional scrolling, what's the best way to handle components that can't wrap uh, like a data table with many columns? Great question. And as with most things, there's a that's definitely would be the one that's top of mind for me as well. Uh, data table is going to be a lot trickier, probably the most tricky component in this scenario. Um, and in that case, you know, doing the best you can to at least make that scrolling experience obvious, maybe in some cases, offering a little bit extra controls. Um, because in Zoom, we uh, the other topic I didn't quite touch on is the user may also be using screen magnification as well, which even further reduces um, their viewable area. So potentially offering extra controls um, it would be one way to help alleviate <laughs> the consequence of having that reduced area. But yeah, there's going to be exceptions like that, unfortunately. I, I think I have uh, another s similar question. Uh, does uh, reduce contrast less still need to meet for dot five to one contrast guidelines? So that's why I wanted to include a disclaimer. <laughs> we don't <laughs> yeah. officially have criteria. So consequently, the only cr criteria that we have would say, yes, we would still consider text contrast. So um, I think a lot of contrast will map back to softening color palettes overall. Um, maybe some essentially not as harsh as you know black on white, but softening that. You might think of it as reducing brightness. But I am also interested as well to see more official criteria come out around that. I think we all are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, next up, um, and uh, please forgive me if I'm if I'm uh, butchering the, the technical references. Um, so what does your type scale CSS look like with all this in mind? Is it a combination of methods or strictly uh, view height, view width units? Yeah, so um, I tend to use uh, the term that you can Google later is fluid typography, and that's going to use the clamp technique um, that we looked at for the context of padding. Um, and so in that context right now, uh, you typically employ a view width unit to respond. Um, since we're on the topic of modern CSS, I'm looking forward to upgrading that particular solution to use container query units, where then it's going to be based on the element size rather than viewport. Um, with those solutions, I usually couple that view width uh, with um, adding in one rem so that it continues to appropriately respond to the Zoom context because we also need to keep in mind the criteria that we need to allow text Zoom at least up to 200%. Um, so all these techniques are amazing. Definitely, I should have included a slide, but please test all of these techniques for your context. Um, they are things that can improve uh, the situation, you know, when you don't have other tools available, um, like I particularly in that situation, we don't have a Zoom specific media query. Um, so definitely test as much as you can across devices and, and with real users. Yeah, good. Sir Stephanie, um, I've got another uh, view height uh, question for you. Um, in the view height example, how do you figure out the max view height size without potentially cutting text off at a certain size? Yes. So um, on our view height example, uh, I probably didn't disclaim that quite as well as I could have. Um, we were using height just strictly so we could visualize that element size changing. I would not recommend as a normal course of business uh, rule to restrict height at all. Um, so I would not be setting an actual height. Um, it was in that instance of vis helping us visualize the space, which I would use uh, for margin um, as we showed for the sections. So just a little, hopefully that helps clarify uh, the intent of that demonstration. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay, um, sorry, they're just rolling in here. Really good ones. Um, how's the browser support uh, for the CSS is min, max, and clamp? Yeah, so min, max, and clamp is 
excellent. Um, the other thing to consider for the techniques we looked at are um, if you are, I think it don't, I should have double checked this. I think they're even supported reasonably well on I-11, but I should double check that as well. <laughs> um, but if you consider that we have good enough support for a vast majority of users and the fallback is that they'll have the side effect that we looked at of, you know, maybe it's taking up more space than is ideal, right? So we can use these techniques as a progressive enhancement to offer that experience where supported. So what I mean by that is if you're using the margin top with um, max or min, then if you find that you do have a need to support earlier than that function is supported, go ahead and include the margin top um, with your pixel value as a rule right above that one, and that will become a fallback. And again, it's a less than ideal experience, but it is still acceptable experience. I think uh, there's another question in the last uh, set that's essentially the same thing. I was saying that this is their favorite presentation, so it's a lot of Let's see. Uh, oh, uh, what are the performance uh, uh, implications uh, of using uh, the, those same CSS functions in the next plans? Um, I was I was having a little bit of feedback from your question. I don't know if that's on. I don't know if my audio is still coming through. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, I can take that question from the Zoom chat if needed. Uh, what are the performance implications of using CSS functions like min, max, and clamp on numerous page elements? To my knowledge, um, not seen a performance impact. Um, they are, I mean, math functions uh, like calc would be an earlier one that's maybe has a tiny bit better support. It's just going to offer different functionality. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not really a significant performance impact. Um, you know, I'm willing to to learn and correct that statement. Um, another question in the example using is to select fo focusable elements. What's the difference between this and selecting the elements directly with standard element selectors? Sure. So um, the difference is more, um, if it's possible to switch back to the slide view, I'll find that example really quickly. Um, so the impact is that uh, for focus, or excuse me, for for selectors where we have, you know, we're assigning this extra um, state of focus, it just improves that shorthand a little easier versus um, listing these out really. In this particular example, I was really using it as a way to squeeze in one more modern CSS uh, property, um, but is... Uh, is something that is more newly supported. Um, and you may find that you want to have a fallback. Again, in this case, if is selector is not supported, um, it essentially falls back to the browser default for focus. So you can decide if that trade-off is acceptable, although less than ideal for your intention. And um, the next question here is, um, is there any difference between developing for high zoom levels does responsive design automatically achieve reflow success? So great question. And that's essentially what I was trying to uh, convey is that no, responsive design does not automatically. Um, biggest take home I hope you have from that section is that viewport size is not a proxy for device capability or user capability. Meaning when you're developing for responsive design, you're more than likely assuming a mobile context. And within that, you're assuming a touch screen, probably, and you're probably assuming a portrait size, right? So we demonstrated that our orientation, if nothing else, is different than what you're probably assuming for a mobile context. So being able to use those techniques to alleviate things like spacing um, and just consider, you know, particularly not dropping content, not dropping functionality. I had an experience recently where uh, green on my desktop 
And when I had it narrow enough that that application assumed I was in a mobile context, it dropped functionality, which ruined my experience. And that wasn't even you know trying to do Zoom or anything else. But assuming mobile context, which happens in responsive design, can cause issues and consequently break reflow in the process. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last question. Okay. <laughs> what about animation that shows as a skeleton loading? How uh, user experience feels this is essential, so it doesn't apply to the guidelines. I'm trying to make a missed word there. We tried to compromise, compromise how much to animate. I think the question is asking if you're trying to use animation to convey that a process is happening, I think is kind of what that boils down to. Um, and you'll want to essentially stick to the WCAG criteria, right? So ensure that that skeleton loading animation doesn't meet like the flashing threshold would be something I would particularly be mindful of, um, at least the skeleton loading animations that I'm thinking of in mind right now. Um, you might just also want to switch and convey that with a textual label, right? So that's going to be actually more clear for everyone that a loading process is happening. So thinking of those alternate solutions, uh, again, I come from product, I come from, you know, marketing, and I understand when you have those requirements come in. Um, but I think, again, that's where if you can test and uh, bring back that data if you need to of why, you know, a text label or... Uh, Reducing motion will help. I hope my, is my audio still wonky? Oh, sound good, at least for the moment. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, thanks, Stephanie, for, for handling all those questions through, through chat here. Uh, apologies uh, for my interruption in audio quality for a second there. Um, Stephanie, fantastic presentation. Thank you so much everyone in asking all of those fantastic questions and uh, participating in chat and watching at home. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, hope, hope you all have a great day. Thanks again, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Have a great one.